Good morning, welcome to another episode of The Health Hub. This is episode five, and for those that are tuning in for the first time, thank you, I appreciate you tuning in, and for those that are long-term watchers, certainly do appreciate uh, the support. The Health Hub is all about uh, presenting what's new in the news, um, controversies, and basically just trying to help you out some good, good news, good advice, and some facts and tips that might make your life better, might make friends' lives better. And we'll present this in a way that is easy to assimilate, so not too much nerdy content, but certainly the sort of stuff that I do do a fact check on this before I uh, throw it all out. Um, so, as per always, we'll need to start with the obligatory read. Um, my name's Gary Bormer, by the way. I am a de degree qualified naturopath. I've been in practice for uh, a bit over 14 years now, so kicking along. Um, okay, the disclaimer. The following segment should be considered as information, education and entertainment only. It is not designed to replace professional individualised recommendations and does not infer ceasing prescription medications. The information is presented, if the information presented here causes concerns about your current health regime, discuss these concerns with the prescribing clinician or a qualified healthcare practitioner in a proper clinical environment. And so that doesn't mean over the back fence with your neighbour, and it also doesn't mean down at the local health food store, um, because they are set up purely to sell you product, not to go into account with your family history, diet, lifestyle needs, as well as any concurrent medications you could be taking because you can hurt yourself. And uh, I'd also temper it with, there's a lot of people now in uh, MLMs that they're saying, oh look, I can help you. They're not qualified and they can hurt you as well. And in the past, I've actually had people get better when I've taken them away from some of those products. Okay, so show five, what we've got is the Octavia diet. The Octavia diet, well, it just sounds like the latest Bond villain, doesn't it? Well, Bond, Octavia are up to their old things again. We're going to have to silence them before Spectre takes over the world. Um, moving on from that diet, yeah, government regulation is called for weight loss programs because there is some rubbish out there. Uh, we'll move into the keto diet. So the ketogenic diet's all the rage. Uh, it has been named the worst diet for 2020. So we'll touch a little bit on that, the positives and the negatives in there. And protein powders. How much do you think you should take? Okay, so this week, our latest Bond villain, the Octavia Diet. So, like, M, what will we do about Octavia? This is a striking a hairless cat with their head cut off from the, the screenshot. Um, Healthline have scored it as a 1 out of 5 for nutritional quality and 1 out of 5 for long term weight loss with an overall score of 2.25 out of 5 so it doesn't matter what school you went to I'm afraid Octavia you have failed and uh, you are the weakest link goodbye I uh, would like to screw you up and just throw you straight over the shoulder but not until you get a little bit of info on why you should avoid the Octavia diet um, it's a diet that has been developed by a company called Medifast, which is basically it's a meal replacement company, and they've taken a bit of a different view on their meal replacements. It's not have three meals a day. Um, they like you to have several small meals a day that amount to around about a thousand calories, um, and that's one up from starvation for us in the Western world. Most people would need 1,200 to get by. 1,500 is sort of a, a more common sort of number. Um, oh, this week, yes, remember, actually water, good idea. So, the whole, oh sorry, I lied, it's 800 to 1000 calories. So, it's worse than I actually remembered. So, how it all starts is you have a phone call with your personal coach. Uh, this coach is any idiot who has bought themselves a franchise, and they may have absolutely no knowledge on diet, lifestyle, nutrition, or disease processes, and can certainly do you some damage, did I say that out loud? And they help you establish the best commission plan for themselves. Oh, no, sorry. They help you establish the best plan for your needs. Just happens to be that whatever that plan is, they do get paid a commission on it, and that's your coach. Uh, you then order all of your meals via your coach, who receives a commission on how many meals they can get you to take per day. And as I said, it's based on only 800 calories, so this is not a lot of food going in, um, and they don't call them meals, they call them fuelings. 
don't be a fuel, don't take the Octavia diet. Probably should have said that for the end before I threw this one away. Uh, they like to spread that 800 calories over five meals a day or five fuelings a day. Uh, but where the intelligent part does come in is they recommend 30 minutes a day of moderate exercise and no alcohol. So I would think if you're just a little shy of starvation, doing 30 minutes exercise and not drinking any alcohol, you're going to lose weight. So basically this isn't very clever in any way, shape or form. It's just a little bit of advice on how to starve yourself and pay for it. Uh, let someone else earn a commission and you will drop weight because you're taking all the bad stuff away. Um, basically what they have found that as soon as you stop on this sort of regime, like so many other meal replacement things, you stop taking them, you haven't learned how to eat. All your old habits come back and you start having bigger meals again and the weight comes back on. So unfortunately, it's one of these, it's another one that's destined to fail you as soon as you stop spending money with them. It also doesn't take into account any medical conditions you might have. So in particular, uh, adrenal fatigue is a big thing that I do and we need to be very aware of regular intakes of food with protein, fats and carbohydrates, otherwise people really do ride that roller coaster of the insulin going up and down and they have mood swings, they're very unproductive at work and stuff like that. So, as far as the Octavia diet taking over to a real world, perhaps not. That is a very good segue into the next segment that we have for government regulation called for weight loss programs. Uh, an obesity expert and director of the obesity program at the University of Sydney's Charles Perkins Centre, uh, Dr Nicholas Fuller, is calling for greater regulation of weight loss programs in Australia as we are now at 67%. Wow, that is past the two out of three. Uh, people classified, sorry, adults, classified as overweight or obese, and that was 2017-2018. Uh, and that in itself is a pretty scary sort of number. Uh, when we look at there are a lot more conditions that are influenced by extra weight, we know that for every one kilo of weight, that's four kilos more stress on your joints. So we're seeing a lot of people with arthritis, and we can talk about ways to get around that. My act is a great, great way to get into it. Uh, but it causes a lot more joint problems for people. It also is leading to um, the diabetic epidemic, or what they're starting to call it, a new term is called diabetes. So as a lot more people are packing on weight, they're becoming diabetic, like the top classic type 2, and we're seeing so many more people prescribed. Uh, we start out with metformin is, is usually the most common, um, but they do start going down that slippery slope, and then we, we see people looking for lap band surgeries and other surgical interventions that are far from safe. I know they say that they're no problems, but they are far from safe. Any operation, any time you have to go under a general anaesthetic, is uh, a, a reasonable risk. Even though it's done every day, you just don't hear about the statistics of how many things go wrong and small problems. Uh, back to Dr. Fuller. He says, there is a no regulation and everyone is an expert. I agree with him on that with backgrounds ranging from social media people, celebrity trainers, and even reality TV personalities using anecdotes and before and after pictures on their effectiveness of their system, but not really helping people. Um, yeah, this guy, he hasn't missed with, with laying that on. I do tend to agree with him to a large uh, capacity as well, because these before and after photos, if you haven't seen all the debunking uh, episodes and you know the myths around it, you really should spend some time. You see people get in there and the first thing is they're poking their gut out as much as they can, they've got a sad look on their face and they adjust the lighting accordingly. When they've gone through the magic program, they're sucking that gut in, they're puffing the chest out, you know, doing the alarms up, they're looking as fit as they possibly can. Uh, they also seem to have a tan in most of them and the lighting is usually a lot darker just to try and adjust that contrast. And there is actually a great video that was getting around on someone who said, this is me as I would do for my, I don't know, Instagram or whatever they were a star of. And this is me what I look like. So within the course of 15 seconds, they went from looking, wow, aren't you taut and trim to, oh gee whiz. Um, yeah, that meal didn't agree with you. You should eat less donuts and drink less. 
So don't fall for any of that crap because it really does just suck people in and when you're desperate I know that some people are looking for whatever they can get to help them out. So, uh, Dr. Fuller goes on and says, uh, up until last year there was a thing called the Weight Management Council of Australia, but it was disbanded because it was ineffective due to most weight loss programs refusing to voluntarily submit their program because very few met the appropriate criteria. That in itself is part of the scary things because if people that are promoting these weight loss programs don't think that they're good enough to understand undergo scrutiny as to their overall health effectiveness and whether they meet all the nutrient requirements, that says my program is crap and I don't want you to know about it so I'm just going to keep on selling it. Um, I was really on board with Dr. Fuller right up until this last bit because he'd actually said that all diet books are bullshit and then he said I've written that in the first page of my own diet book. So Dr. Fuller has gone to great lengths to say how diet books are rubbish, but then he's written one himself, and unfortunately he says, my diet's a good one. Just buy my book and you will find out. Damn shame, uh, lots of intelligent information that he actually put forward in there. And it just sort of got lost in that little bit of uh, his own interest. Um, what we will add into this is probably a big one that so many programs do result in rebound weight gain. It's because how people learn to eat to put all that weight on, and let's face it, you didn't go to bed at 80 kilos and wake up at 125. It comes on slowly but surely. Um, people that have you know, had massive steroid injections for health conditions, they do pack it on within a week. You know, there are exceptions, but for the vast majority, you've gone up a size in clothes, and you've gone up another size in clothes. So you are aware that this is happening. People just don't act on it very quickly, and we tend to see when there is a problem, it's usually a health concern, like there is uh, pre-diabetes or the, the joints are starting to hurt, that people go, oh yeah, now I need to do something about it. Early intervention is the way to go. But what we have found with so many of these meal replacement style programs, people drop the weight and they are successful in that and I have seen people do it with some pretty junky programs. They've dropped down and one person was, they dropped 20 kilos and they were pretty chuffed about that. However, over the course of only two years, they put back 22 kilos. And that is very common. That 10% interest is what gets charged when people come off these meal replacement diets. So just having shakes for twice a day and then salads, it will make you drop the weight. But keeping it off, keeping it off is where you really have to implement dietary changes, lifestyle changes, the regular exercise, uh, at least mild, but in better cases moderate. So a fast walk, not just a gentle stroll around the block that any activity is good. So don't get me wrong, even if all you can manage is a gentle stroll around the block, that's better than sitting on the lounge looking at the latest episode of the latest reality TV show that's out there. Oh, yes, and in my notes here, <clears throat> there was one that I saw with before and after photos. Absolute fantastic job, because whatever diet that she went on, she managed to, her boobs were bigger and perkier and her lips were fuller. So she actually got a boob job and uh, some collagen injections and went, look how my diet works for me so well, don't look heaps better. Absolute rubbish. All right, we did touch on uh, My Active being our sponsor for the week. And um, as per always, My Active is just one of these products that we have a lot of time for in this clinic. We've seen some sensational results with it. And it's one of these that can't hurt you. And why I'm saying that is because there was an article recently, it, it literally got no more than five seconds on the six o'clock news, and they were saying people that just take pure glucosamine, they really are going to have to be very careful because there are lots of people that have seafood allergies and most glucosamine come from crustacean shells and they could have anaphylactic shock and potentially die if they're not prepared for it. This is not untrue. However, most people that have got arthritis and are taking an arthritis product, they're going to be up in their 40s or 50s. They know if they've got a seafood allergy. They've had that bad experience probably back in their teens or 20s. It was just sensationalism. Why bother? Um, why do you have to beat up glucosamine mainstream? I don't know. Um, well, in my active, bottom point on the brochure, and there, shellfish free. So why I say you can't go wrong with it is purely because there is no shellfish in there either. And we know all the ingredients from the uh, safety profiles, you can eat several of these things and you are still, so far within the safety profiles, it's not funny. 
indeed um, even safer than regular table saw. So there we go. My active, if you've got joint pain, do yourself a favour. Tell, you, tell your friends, try it yourself. miactiv.com.au. Can't go wrong. The keto diet. Now, this is something a lot of celebs are on, a lot of people are talking about it, you know, doing keto. Yeah, good on you. Well, it has just been named the worst diet in 2020, according to the US News and World Report, and as reported in Better Homes and Gardens. Can't get really much of a better um, pedigree than that one for publicity. However, it is a real report. Uh, it was compared to 35 other diets as well, and it came out the worst. Um, might even be a little bit harsh in my mind. However, what is keto and how do people achieve it? And that's where all these things vary. What you want to get is into a process called ketosis, where you're actually producing ketones. And this is actually a little, little harsh in your kidneys. And that's why in the early days um, of going into a, a ketogenic style diet, people can get headaches, brain fog, oh, bad breath. There's a thing called keto flu. Uh, I wrote an article a little while back on how a lot of people are getting a thing called keto rash. And that's probably pretty serious. Uh, but some of the lemmings that we're getting are going, yeah, but I love keto and I'm just going to push my way through keto rash. That's pretty stupid in my opinion, because if you're getting uh, a lot of these really extreme reactions, that's your body going, this is not for me, or this is not for you. And uh, how they've gotten there, and that's what we don't really know, because some people will have up to 60% fats in their diet to get to ketosis, uh, as little as 5% in some of them, and some will only have 10 or 20% of, um, of protein in there. This is what varies between people. I like to see maybe about 40 percent fat, around 45, 50% protein. So I tend to go the higher protein route if we can, because plenty of people have got gallbladder issues, don't have gallbladders. You go to a really high fat diet with them, they are going to be nauseous, they're going to feel miserable as anything. And if they've got undiagnosed gallstones, you start giving them big hits of fat, that gallbladder is going to be going over time, squeezing out the bile and potentially mobilizing these gallstones. They can get caught in a common bile duct and that's a quick trip up to your local hospital. Um, luckily for me, mine's only two minutes up the road. And it is pretty well emergency surgery and your gallbladder will be pulled out. So there are the things wrong with the ketogenic diet straight off the cuff. Um, what they've also said, not in that article, but there was another one published in February 2020. So this is being recorded in February 2020, so it was only this week. Uh, they have actually said that the ketogenic diet may wear down bones in athletes, especially compared to higher carb diets. And that in itself is a bit of a no-brainer. When you're competing um, or you're a serious trainer, you need carbohydrates for fuel. That's what the body likes. It prefers to burn glucose. Um, converting fats and protein back into glucose, uh, the pro process called as gluconeogenesis, is really inefficient. And that's why it's great for losing weight. But if you're an athlete, you need to have lots of readily available energy, primarily in the form of simple um, bioavailable carbohydrates. So that's why they talk about rice and passes to load up before races. There is actually some theory behind it. But when you're recovering from exercise, you need to replete your glycogen stores. And there has been studies done on this, that having higher carbohydrate stuff directly after exercise can help you recover faster and better so that you can go out and train more intensely and frequently faster. So think the next day if you're into a high training regime. So if you are on a very, very, very low carbohydrate diet, which is what the ketogenic diet tends to be, your body is starving of this, and so what it does in the human body is fantastic. Well, it starts robbing from here, there, and everywhere, trying to get enough energy to uh, be able to cope with those high loads of output that you're putting on it. And in this one, uh, it was only a very short study, it was only over eight weeks. They found that uh, bones were actually suffering a little bit more damage in those people that didn't have the carbohydrate recovery. Why bones, don't know. Why did they study bones, don't know. But uh, my thought down that avenue is that when we get into the ketogenic diet, uh, quite often it can be very acid forming. And where we have an acid forming diet, this can be quite tough on the skeletal system. Uh, I think it was Tim Arnett, or Professor Tim Arnett, that actually discovered 
um, even little changes in pH um, as far as becoming more acidic will stimulate osteoclast activity and what osteoclasts are these are the little things that occur naturally in our body that strip bone down and then we have osteoblasts that come along and they rebuild rebuild the bone. So we're actually remodel our, our skeleton about every seven to eight years. So pretty clever that we're, we're constantly doing our own strip down and repair. So great maintenance program in there, very clever. Um, so if you've got more stripping down going on than maintenance being done, you can see where this is going to go. That's where bone thinning, osteoporosis, osteopenia, these, these conditions can happen. And when we're talking young athletes, especially females, we know that their best bone density is going to be in their early 20s. So if they're doing activities and having a diet that is not good for their skeleton, this is just going to come back and haunt them later in life because that is as good as it gets. And when the thing called an epiphyseal plate, um, whether it comes in, goes out, can't quite recall now, but that's, that's how they can tell by an x-ray if someone has stopped growing. They're actually looking for this line at the base of the long bones. So when that happens, that's it. You don't grow any taller. All you're doing is stripping out and maintaining at that level of skeleton. So if you've got a, a bad skeleton when that happens, everything you do later in life isn't going to make that any better. You are stuck with that for the rest of your life in several strip downs and rebuilds. So keto diet, well, you know, there's positives to it. It was originally developed to help with epilepsy, and apparently it is very good at it. I haven't uh, personally treated any epileptic patients with a ketogenic diet. Oh, sorry, I do. I did have one. Uh, he was getting seizures, and we found by dramatically reducing his carbohydrates down, this person was having multiple seizures in a day. We went down to only a couple a week, and we actually got it down to a little bit of science that they could actually have, I think it was five chips. Not crisps, but, you know, five chips. And they were, they were fine, you know, go to six, and then they could actually feel the seizures starting to come on. So we knew that utilising this style of diet was very beneficial for them. And there was a lot of evidence around on the ketogenic diet and epilepsy. Uh, it was just noted that it happened to cause people to lose weight. And that's what everyone else has jumped on. So is it as bad as they make out? Well, for some people, yes, it is. And it can be very bad and a very bad idea. Uh, as per usual, all these celebs, they've got chefs cooking for them, they've got trainers, they've got a lot of support. But when it's just you out there, you against the world, or as I said, you and me against the world, that was a line in some song, you don't have that someone coming in every day to make sure that you are exercising correctly. You don't have someone balancing all your meals out. You're going to some web page or the Women's Weekly Cookbook to get your dietary ideas, and it might not be ideal for you. So. Anyone who ever wants to embark upon a, a good dietary regime, always see a qualified health professional first and not the person over the back. Okay. Finally, protein powders. How much do we need and how much can the body actually use? And that's probably the real crux of it. How much can the body actually use? So this was um, written by a guy called David Rogerson. He is a senior lecturer in sports nutrition and strength conditioning at Sheffield Hallam University over in Merry Old England. Um, what he did find that uh, at least one in two gym goers actually take some sort of protein supplement. And I've seen plenty of roid boys, I mean uh, people in the, the gym that are walking around with a protein shake and they're drinking it as they're moving from machine to machine, you know, sort of almost carrying it like some sort of badge of honor. Yeah, keep my protein up while I exercise. Yeah, you're probably wasting your time and money. Um, what he did look into was how much protein, when to eat it, and indeed whether you actually do need to supplement it. So with protein shakes, for example, as I've just talked about. And this has been debated by scientists for years. So what they have discovered is the average person needs about 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of weight per day. So that's not a real large amount. So just do your own maths, you know. 100 kilos, um, you know, shift the decimal point over there, that says 80 grams, and that's it. So if you looked at, let's say, a steak, um, ran about 50% protein in there. So if you had one of those great big hoofing breakfast creek steaks, there's probably 200 grams of protein. That's miles more than the average person needs. We do tend to talk about um, palm size. So the size of your palm, thickness of your palm, is usually around about 100 grams in total. So again, if we use the rule of thumb and said half of that's protein, give or take, depends on you know what sort of flesh we're talking, you know, fish is different to chicken, which is different to lamb, which is different to beef, uh, moving on. Uh, all of those have different amounts. So 
if we just did simple rule and said halfway, we know that a hundred gram piece of chicken breast is going to get you 50 grams. So you don't need bucket loads of this stuff. However, athletes can be between 1.2 grams and 1.6, so they can double that up. But still, do you need three protein shakes a day as well as chicken and some other protein source at dinner time and nuts as snacks? Probably not. You're probably overdoing it. And depending on what source of protein you're using, that too can be very tough on your joints. And I have seen some professional bodybuilders and their joints and their skeleton was just a disaster. They knew it and they knew that it was from their supplement regime. Um, add on top of that that they could be training with 200 kilos at a time. So when your joints are under a lot of stress from a very acid forming diet and you start putting incredible load across them, multiply by four remember, we see a real lot of pressure on those joints and that's why they have plenty of skeletal issues and they are very old a long time before they're due. So, you know, they're 70 year olds in a 25 or 30 year olds body in some cases. Um, so, uh, what, what is he, David Rogerson, what he's gone on to say is that uh, it's generally accepted now the optimal amount of protein is only 20 to 25 grams at a serve. So, not five big scoops in your protein shake, uh, depending on what brand you're getting, that's probably only one or two, and that's all. Uh, as he said, one scoop or 100 grams of lean chicken. Oh, there goes my maths when I was saying maybe 50%. Uh, he's saying probably only 20, 25% of protein in chicken. So there's a lot of something in chicken. I have to go and check that one out. Um, he also considers, no, that's me. I consider that to be the minimum amount for weight loss also. So you need to have at least 20 grams of protein at a serve um, and at a meal if you want to facilitate weight loss. Um, he has found that the ideal window is apparently 90 to 120 minutes after intense exercise, that's his word. However, it doesn't seem to matter what sort of protein, whether it be protein powder or even a flash base. So if you're chowing down a drum, drumstick, no difference. Um, but he does say that whey, whey protein has been considered to be faster absorbed. Now, what does that mean? Well, to Joe Public, there is 500 different sorts of protein out there in protein powder. So, what, what we said is supplementing isn't necessarily bad for you. You might have too much and it's not going to do any good for you, except, well, it's just not going to do any good for you. It will burn a hole in your pocket that you don't need, and it could potentially cause a, a few joint issues down the track, um, as well as becoming a bit smelly, keto breath. Um, yeah, it's like acetone breath. Um, yeah, and you general body odor as well. Um, so, you know, not the sort of thing you go into the gym to try and look pretty and you stink. Um, so basically, if you get it right, you're not going to hurt yourself. But some of these protein powders that are out there, they've got a list of ingredients. There's like four lines long of all this stuff. And it's stuff. It's whey protein powder or it isn't. Uh, the stuff that I provide for people, it's from cows that have been grass fed, so just how nature intended. And you look at the ingredients, it says a whey protein concentrate, not the isolate, doesn't need to go that high either. Plus a bit of lesser than, just to help it dissolve when you put it in water or you put it in your almond milk. That's it. You don't need flavours, you don't need colours, you don't need to have any other very clever sort of amino acid blend in there because whey protein has all of your amino acids. And as some of them that are out there, they go, this absorbs 15 seconds faster than the leading brand. Yes! No, that's stupid. It's taking your money off you. You don't need to have absorbed 15 seconds faster than the leading brand because the window is 90 to 120 minutes. So there you go. Hopefully that is a little bit of good advice for you. Might actually help you get a more quality product into you. If you do need a quality product, I keep several of these proteins because when we are talking weight loss, I do like moving into a higher protein style diet. And for people that are just using it as a, a quick meal replacement, have a good product, a quality one. Not crap that is very expensive or because Roids R Us at the local shopping centre says this is good because it's absorbed faster and it's really good. That's what I take. Look at me. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there we go. That's my rant for the week. Um, hopefully you've learned something from all this and you found it informative um, and got some really good information out of it. So the whole idea, like I said at the start, is to help you and help your friends so you don't hurt yourself, you don't get sucked into some of these trends 
and you don't just rip up a lot of money on things that aren't doing you any benefit and may indeed harm you.